we had to bring you this. Let's put this up there on the screen. Uh, Amer- the West has sent its best and its brightest to Ukraine on Mother's Day. I shouldn't make too much fun. Uh, for Jill Biden, the first lady, I thought it was nice that she went Dr. over there. Dr. Jill seems lovely. Uh, yeah, Dr. Jill, that's right, in order to lift spirits for Mother's Day. But Bono and Trudeau accompanied her. Trudeau, of course, being another leader of a NATO nation. And, you know, pretty significant there. Bono, I think, was representing the United Nations as a goodwill ambassador or something like that. So those three went over there in the context of broader Western declarations of sympathy, of course, you know, from a security situation to have the first lady visit. Uh, Ukraine is incredibly a significant event, but we already sent our secretary of state, so it's more a matter of goodwill. On the diplomatic front, let's put this up there on the screen because this is very important. G7 nations have now pledged to ban or phase out Russian oil. Of course, the G7 includes Germany, and that was always the number one concern of, well, what are exactly are the Germans going to do here? Because they rely so much on Russian natural gas. So the European Union right now is getting about a quarter of its crude oil import from Russia. Now, what they are committing to with this declaration is to phase out Russian oil. And right now, they're still in talks to formalize that decision. So it's not 100% uh, you know, declared exactly. The other reason why this matters, though, is that people forget this, is that Japan Japan is also in the G7, and Japan is a major oil-consuming nation. Mm -hmm. So for Japan to say that they're going to phase out, both actually, it's an interesting kind of uh, Asia-Pacific, Asia-Pacific declaration of solidarity with the West. They try generally not to uh, align themselves this way, but Japan, of course, also has its own history of war with Russia, and they're really just trying in order to get Western solidarity with them in the event that they end up in a conflict with China. So to see them come along with us in this way is actually pretty significant because they also import a decent amount of stuff from Russia in terms of production. So Mm -hmm. anyway, what I would say is that that is probably the most significant diplomatic action in probably the last two months since the declaration of those financial sanctions. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, again, if you go back to the beginning of this, remember the very early days, Mm -hmm. the thought was the swift banking sanctions were like like, like the end-all be-all of whether you were serious or not about this whole sanction situation. And man, we zoomed right past that. I mean, at the beginning, the idea that the G7 would outright ban Russian oil, even, you know, as it's a little bit unclear exactly when it's going to happen, it'll be over a timeline and phase and all of that. I mean, I think that would have um, blown all of our minds at the time. Oh, but yeah, 100%. Bit by bit I would have been bit. like, that's unthinkable. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's no way. Yeah. Like, they, just, they, they can't do that. They're not going to do right. that. Um, and so we're starting to see what the, the future looks like, which is, you know, Russia is put in this camp of the official baddie pariah states um, that the U.S. is going to try to sort of bleed dry and, and crush economically over a long period of time. And— It's hard to know from reporting within the country of just how much these uh, sanctions have hit and how much they've devastated the local population. It's hard to get an accurate picture of that at this point, but there's no doubt if this continues over the long haul. I mean, this will be devastating for uh, regular Russian civilians and for the country. And obviously part of, um, you know, the overall strategy here, which is not to secure peace, it's to weaken Russia, which frankly is what— you know, if we'd said that at the beginning, people would have said, oh, you're, those are Putin's talking points, you're a conspiracy theorist, et cetera, et cetera. And yet now here we are with, you know, the administration outright admitting it, Boris Johnson reportedly going to Kiev and saying, hey, we don't want peace. We want you to keep going. Um, Seth Moulton, Democratic congressman, saying, oh, no, actually, we are at war with Russia, so we be thinking, should be thinking of things in that way. All of this happened so quickly and with so little public understanding or discussion that it really is astonishing. And, you know, um, Ukraine has fallen a little bit out of the news. It's not, you know, the wall-to-wall coverage isn't there anymore, especially with the big Mm -hmm. news about Roe versus Wade, which we're about to talk talk about as well. And at the same time, these incredibly momentous um, and potentially, like, era-defining decisions are being made And the U.S. public is really not being involved in that. Yeah, actually, it's funny. We can just tell you. I mean, we can see our data. Ukraine does not perform all that well. Now, we still stacked the first half hour of the show with it because we think it's really important. And we have a subscriber-based model. But, you know, if you're a cable news programmer, you don't want to be covering um, all of this stuff because you know that it's not going to rate. Luckily, we don't have necessarily the exact same incentive structure. But that's a peek into how exactly these things get made. Your viewership and people's general interest is what drives a lot of the debate and the meta conversation. Part of the point I'm 
made in my monologue about the culture wars on Thursday was, just so you know, while we're all squabbling about abortion, the CIA loves that because that is when the gray war actually operates at its highest level, when they have zero public scrutiny. So the, out, I did not see nearly enough outcry on the first story that we covered. I didn't see nearly enough analysis on the oil markets. Yeah. Also, do we just live in a reality now where gas is four fifty a gallon? I mean, <laughs> right. seriously. Like, yeah. I mean, months ago, oh, strategic petroleum reserve. Now what? I mean, by the way, it costs a lot of money to fill up your tank. I have not driven past a gas station in two months that was less than $4 a gallon. And I think the national average is still for something. Just so you know, it was a catastrophe then. It's a catastrophe now. But the you know the conversation on this stuff just continues to fizzle out. G7 is going to ban it. Okay, great. Is anybody going to give us any more gas or something? Because people are really struggling out there. And you know that part of the conversation is missing too. Yeah, that is very well said. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.